and a warm welcome to the Open Treasury podcast, your go-to source for the latest news and analysis in corporate cash and treasury management. This show is brought to you by ctmfile.com and the Treasury News Network, where treasury professionals learn and share the information that matters most. My name is Pushpendra Mehta and my guest for today is Craig Jeffrey, Managing Partner and Strategic Treasurer. Welcome back to the Open Treasury Podcast, Craig. Push, it's good to be here again. I always enjoy our conversations. And today's conversation, Craig, is a topic which is very close to my heart because it's got the word unexpected events. For the benefit of our CTM file audience, we will begin our conversation by discussing the 13th topic and the 14th article in a series on leading practices in corporate treasury published on CTM file. This article is about preparing for and monitoring unexpected events. Craig, a key component of liquidity management is having an accurate and comprehensive view of your assets and capital at all times. Preparing for liquidity challenges that can arise out of the occurrence of an unexpected, improbable or disruptive event is a critical responsibility that the treasurer is entrusted with. Bracing for unexpected events is, in its essence, a strategic organizational exercise. You have said that being well organized is the critical first step in preparing for an unexpected event or development. Craig, how does being well-organized better prepare treasurers for the unanticipated and facilitate comprehensive visibility into the organization's liquidity? Well, I'm glad this topic is near and dear to your heart. It's, uh, it's near and dear to my heart as well. The idea that we should be well-organized as treasury professionals is a critical first step. But, but what, do, what do we mean by that? When I think of being well organized. I go back to scouting days when we talked about the being prepared is the is the scout motto. If for those who uh, are in scouts or not, it's just helpful to know that. Well, what is what are you to be prepared for? It's two words, and it's really for anything. It's like and how do you prepare for anything? That's oftentimes seems overly broad. And so when you think about the ten essentials for the backcountry or you know, you go on a hike, for example, and you're going to be in the back country where you don't have access, your phone may not reach. Uh, what do you bring? And so the 10 essentials are these elements that will help you survive, not necessarily th- thrive, but, but certainly survive. And so the ability to start a fire, for example, or, you know, purify water or bring your water and also be able to purify water gives you the opportunity to better survive. It's more important than food, right? You can survive a longer time without food than you can without water. And so that's, that's essential. The ability to fix issues if you get, um, you know, harmed or cut, you know, the ability to repair a wound. So, you know, first aid kit is part of that. The ability to tell directions and know where you are. So whether it's a GPS or it's a map and compass, being able to know where you are, where you're going and what the route is. There's a number of these things. I'm not going to go through what the 10 essentials are, but that idea of being prepared or being well organized is really the first key step. So when we think about an unexpected event or development, the other item is that unexpected events happen. We may not know the specific event, but stuff will happen that you don't like, that you don't anticipate. It will happen multiple times in your career. It may not, it won't happen every month, won't happen every quarter, but it'll happen at different times. You have to think about that. It's like, oh, we didn't expect this bubble to occur or this action by Russia invading Ukraine or blocking the ports and there's grain that caused a ripple effect. We don't know what those particular events are. And it's really it's really almost impossible to predict the individual events, but you know they're going to happen. Events are going to happen that cause a disruption. You don't know when or what they are exactly, but they will impact parts of your business and there will be a repercussion for your liquidity. And I think that's that's a key part. I think I remember telling you a story about you can put yourself in a position thinking everything's fine with my daughter driving, you know, I had her on my lap or driving down a dirt road. She yanked the steering wheel, like we're on a straight road. It's like, there's nothing that can go wrong. Well, she yanked the steering wheel and all of a sudden we're into a skid. And, you know, now I never trust anybody <laughs> because you're like, like you think, what are the risks? There are none. Like you've, you've, 
made a, an assumption that there aren't risks or that the these things couldn't happen, you know, and or you you put such a low weight on particular risks that you think your uh, your company, your driving skills, whatever, put you out of an arena where a significant disruption can occur. They will happen. You may not know that you have to spend ten thousand pounds. $12,000 on repairing your roof, uh, uh, plumbing breaks or something else. You may not know what the issues are, but something's going to happen every couple of years where you have an outlay that's, you know, five figures that you have to cover. That's going to happen. You don't know what it is, but that's going to happen. So I think part of it is knowing that these unexpected events are expected is a mindset. And then this idea, you have some of some of the similar idea of like the 10 essentials is how are you prepared? And there should also be like, if you're you know, backpacking, you're like, I'm not going to be out that long and I'm wearing cotton. And all of a sudden you get lost. Uh, it rains and now your cotton is, is wet. It's drawing your body heat away and you're getting hypothermic. So what was a regular walk that I don't have to worry about anything is now a potential life threatening issue, or I slip and nobody knows where I went. I mean, I guess all of those things drive us to the, should drive us to the point of we're risk managers and we prepare for known risks and we prepare for various risks or unexpected factors against a number of dimensions, even though we may not have a complete list of what could happen or how these events can happen together. I think that's really the the first part about being organized uh, and and thinking about that. And the the last part of your question asked about about visibility, you know, comprehensive visibility into organizational liquidity in good times. Or bad times, you have to know where your company's liquidity is. That means, you know, first, I need to be able to see all of my cash across the globe on a daily basis. That is a cost of doing business. Don't let anybody argue that you have to do a cost benefit analysis of seeing all of your cash liquidity across the, the globe. That's a, that's a factor of doing business. That's a commercial, that's not only commercially reasonable, it's a minimum standard. Just like to the accountant who's probably telling you that. That, that, that you need to at least at least reconcile every month. Why do you need to do that? Why don't you have to do a you know cost benefit analysis on that? So that's another you know component of being prepared. But organizational liquidity also goes into your receivables, your payables, maybe capex spending. Having a process where that's material items are reported in either automatically or on a regular cadence that people are pushing information above a certain threshold. You know, maybe you care about $5 million worth of liquidity. That means any item that's over a million should be reported because an aggregated number of these could push you over 5 million. So, you know, the listener needs to adjust for whatever is material in their area. And that, that lets everyone have a better, longer term view of what's going on. Since we're using different analogies, it's like driving your car with GPS. It wasn't that long ago. We didn't have our phones with GPS and mapping and tracking and telling you the traffic patterns and suggesting alternative routes. Before that, it was GPSs, which were a little more static that didn't have other traffic. And before that, it was maps. The Automobile Association gave you trip ticks, where it was a little map and you could flip it over and it would tell you where things are. And maybe they have a stamp about, hey, there's construction here or there's a speed trap or whatever. They'd put that information on a map. That was better than nothing. But compared to what we have today, it's very, very different. Um, when you're driving, you look through your windshield, you can see, maybe you can see half a mile ahead if the road is really straight. But oftentimes you're looking no farther than a quarter of a mile ahead. And you can see if there's traffic piled up or something. But sometimes when, by the time you see an issue, just by looking through your windshield, there is no time to react. So how do we see farther? How do we see past the curve? Having good forecasting, good visibility, not only to the what's in my cash today, what's directly in front of my car, but as we look farther down the road, you know, receivables, payables, other cash flows, other significant payments, those are all vital. And then also having the capacity to weather a, a shortfall or a storm uh, through that. So those are those are a few of the parts there. Whether the storm you said, and astute and strategic treasurers know that if you need to weather the storm, you have to perform a regular review to identify and measure organizational liquidity and the various factors that adversely impact liquidity. Regular assessment of challenges and risks to liquidity is extremely important in anticipation of the new, the emerging 
and or disruptive events Craig what according to you are the key components that must be identified analyzed and measured so that organizational liquidity isn't impacted in a negative direction should an unexpected or anomalous event occur the idea that visibility is required to cash flows and understanding of the cash flow cycles and then the major contributors to shifts in those those are vital and it could be there's prepayments on on investments that you have that all of a sudden turn over a lot of cash that you now have to reinvest at a lower rate uh, that may be one you know understanding those but but understand the core business cycle for most organizations is important is it cyclical on within a month within a period or you know maybe it's related to summer months or winter months could be related to temperature if it's commodities or heat or oil or air conditioning whatever those things are knowing the cash flow cycle knowing the business cycles is vital and then the major influencers on those those are those are some of the pieces that that have to be addressed so when we look at what has to be identified or analyzed so we think about operating so that's the regular part of the business there's investments and financing so when we think about the traditional cash flow models we have to think about when are my credit facilities coming due do i renew them earlier why does that matter i mean so so knowing when those things are is crucially important you're renewing them a little early as a normal course of business maybe you're renewing them earlier because you can go out longer maybe you're renewing them earlier because you're ensuring that you have enough room in case you know let's say the the debt markets are frozen or tightened up too much when it's time for you to re- renew and now you're in a bad position for what will cover the next one to you know 3 years for example so those are those are some of the key components to identify and look at and see where things make sense so what are my uses of cash where are my sources of liquidity what are the time frames how diverse am i how diversified am i with my access to capital across different domains you know from credit facilities to leveraging my cash conversion cycle across the board what and what's the business doing so those are those are some of the the elements that have to be uh, analyzed and monitored you know, throughout the the annual cycle and you know as time advances it is said that before a challenging event occurs which is also connected to time or when an unexpected event unfolds it is important for treasurers to communicate frequently with their key constituencies equally important it is to get advice or sagacious inputs from various sources both internal and external craig who are the key internal and external stakeholders and or sources that corporate treasurers should seek advice or inputs from uh, to respond appropriately to changing events and developments for getting input it's it's not just getting wise input it's getting multiple points of input too so you want the best of both um and so where are those sources well one of them should be your bankers another one should be peers in the industry or other people in your role other treasurers uh your consultants your trusted advisors across the the venue and so and wherever else you get that advice whether it's through podcasts listening to certain news channels or discussions those are helpful you know the idea of of listening to current events is certainly helpful to spur current ideas and issues and you can think of whenever there's been events in difficult times like the you know the financial crisis certain things are happening that don't happen very often and so you don't get a lot of chance to see those things happen and since you don't see those things happen it almost you forget about them i think of that the physical example of in Japan there was the tsunami that created the reactor event but what did they also find and pay attention to on the top of the mountain side there's rocks up there that said don't build below this point you know don't build your house below this point because you know tsunamis have crashed up this high and so it hasn't happened in the last week the last month it didn't happen in my lifetime dad or grandpa was you know a little too overcautious about doing things so we don't think those things could happen i mean why do people build on floodplains they do it time and time again because of timing mean, uh why do people build near the ocean where they can get destroyed part of it's because well there's other parts because you get your get all your money back and they'll rebuild you through certain insurance programs that's another story but the idea that we don't think things these things will happen because it's not in our 
recent memory of five years or 10 years. I think that's another thing is we're sitting at the very end of June and there's a number of things happening. Um, and there's some people that haven't been through high inflation or when it happened, they were not born or they were not out of school. And so the impact and the perception was is very different. And so the lived experience and the institutional experience needs to go beyond what you've experienced in your life. You know, we always learn from what we've seen, but we have to extend that learning beyond that. So with the discussions with bankers and consultants and other peers, we also have to look at these these events over time. Even if the, the particular event can't happen, the disruptive patterns can occur. So read, just, you know, continue to read, read, read books on risk, read books on insurance, read books on the stock market crash and the great recession, you know, recession, depression, re, you know, read, read on those things to learn what's, what's happened over time. That allows you to extend your learning and mindset beyond the years that you've had. Let's say you're, you're really brilliant and you've been in treasury for 10 or 12 years, you can't be really brilliant if you're only looking at that type of time frame. You can look at 100 years, you know, by by being able to read and understand what's occurring. Uh, you can extend the depth of what you know by talking to others, other peers, bankers who are talking to many people, consultants who can help you think through these these risks. I think those are ways where we we magnify our institutional knowledge by standing on the shoulders of people who have evaluated things before by talking to others, not saying, I've got all this figured out. You may hear a lot of things. Some things may be, you may disregard, but you you hear what people say and think. And that can stimulate uh, a number of ideas and thoughts. So getting multiple inputs that are current and contemporaneous, as well as multiple inputs that extend the time frame and maybe the geographies, you know, what's happened in other countries with currency fluctuations or with different central bank actions. So there's there's lots of areas we can learn if we're willing to commit the time. So you mentioned some very important things. You said reading, you said listening to podcasts, you said watching webinars, for example. You also said experience. I guess you also said conversations with people that matter. My next question is kind of linked to this. And I'm going to possibly add another part to that, which is that this particular question to my mind would be tremendous interest to corporate treasures. It is said that you should never rule out any possibility so that you can respond effectively even when an event occurs for which a specific action plan does not exist or is not well matched. To what you've just said about reading, watching, listening, conversation, seeking advice, all of this is extremely important. Given all of this and given your experience and you know, as a top a leading consultant who's also been a former banker. How do you develop a never rule out any possibility mindset? And is experience an impediment or it can it be an impediment? Or should you see a student of your craft so that you don't allow experience to become an impediment? Yeah, I think an experience is an experience. The mindset is the problem and the mindset is the opportunity. So if you are building on your experiences by thinking these are things that happened, they could have happened differently. What are other experiences that are out there? This mindset of this is what I've, I've learned from those particular experiences that can be helpful. This is all that can be, or this particular exact iteration of an experience is all that can be that then it's an impediment, but that's really more of a mindset. Mm -hmm. You probably know some people that are like natural risk managers. They walk into a room, you walk into the kitchen, you're like, okay, that's going to catch on fire. Um, it's like, why are you putting a wooden bowl on top of a toaster oven where the surface gets hot? And if the thing overheats, you could catch that wood on fire. Um, paper towels shouldn't be located next to the stove. You can go on and on about that. That glass is too close to the edge. Certain things may trigger you to say, whoa, that's dangerous. This is not a good environment. This is not a good good setup, who leaves marbles at the top of stairs, what, whatever those items are, some people are better at seeing potential problems. You walk around, you can almost be paranoid and say, how am I going to childproof the world? We can overdo things. But that, that type of mindset that looks and sees what could potentially happen is pretty important. And part of that, 
there, there's a couple elements to that push that I think are are important. It's you shouldn't rule out anything, but you have to be able to focus on certain elements. And so when you look at here are all the risks that exist. There's let's say oh there's 500 risks. Well, 300 of them are immaterial, wouldn't matter to you anyway, or they're so small they're they're not an issue. And so now you've excluded, you've looked at those and they're, they're dismissed because they're, they're going to be immaterial. So of the rest, how do I, you know, how do I calibrate all those risks and think about what's, what can potentially happen? I think the biggest thing is it's not just saying, um, Hey, this is low likelihood. I can exclude it. Low likelihood is not a reason to exclude an evaluation of the risk. High impact needs to be considered. So if it's, moderate or high likelihood and high impact, you're planning for that. You already have that down. You know, unless you're quite foolish, you're planning for those things that are moderate to high level of impact, moderate to high likelihood of occurring and a high impact to your organization. That's, you know, everyone's doing that unless you're completely derelict in your duties. The area that people run into problems are the low likelihood, high impact, high impact. And I know we've talked about some of these, some of these types of things before, and you're a huge fan of Nicholas Tlaib and, you know, and some other people that look and view risk, but you know, the, the black swan event, uh, Oh, I didn't think this could happen. That's one aspect. The other is, I think this could be the case, but it's so unlikely. I think this could happen, but it's so unlikely. It doesn't need to be considered. And the, if there's a big impact that matters, you know, just, just seeing that there's a, that, Oh, there's black swans. I thought they were all white. That doesn't really matter other than that you made an assumption that wasn't the case. But what if there's something that this is so unlikely and now that impairs my organization's liquidity. Now that's, that's substantive and that's significant. You know, one of the, the ideas of that is we, maybe it's not we, but it, it seems like, there's people that are good at finance and those that aren't just generally they're good with, with looking at numbers and seeing the magnitude of things. And for those that are good at finance, some are, some are very good at coming to a number and some are good at seeing the variation of what can happen. They roll a pair of dice and you can get between two and 12 with one roll. What's the expected value? What are you going to get when you roll two dice? You're going to get a seven. That's the most frequently occurred, but, but it's not, you're going to get a seven every time. I mean, a million times you're going to average seven if you roll it, but there's a range just on that individual roll from two to 12. As you look at those, you can say, what's the frequency of that happening? There's 36 combinations of different die and, and, and different numbers. So the distribution of those 11 different numbers from two to 12, two and a 12, there's one chance out of getting that. You have to, both dice have to hit that. So it's, you know, one thirty sixth. Um, and 12 is getting one six likelihood to get a six and one six likelihood to get a six is a one thirty six percent one out of 36 likelihood. You get that some people in finance are very good and say, Hey, it's expected to be seven. And there's a sense where like, Hey, that's most common, but what's the variation. And so when you look at the tails, you know, the two and the three and the 11 and the 12 or whatever those numbers are out on the side, you know, as opposed to the peak of seven in the middle, what does that mean? when we look at those tails is one of those, it's a, it's a severe liquidity situation. If I get a, a two, three or a four, that's a really bad situation. How will I account for that? How can I reduce the impact of that end of the scale? Or maybe the other end of the scale is something else. It's about time of payout or whatever the elements are is we need to think about that distribution whether it's a, a tight distribution or it's really wide, where there's really long tails that go out in terms of the opportunities, right? Like rolling a pair of dice is you know, pretty easy. You know, one time, what two times you can see what that looks like. That type of mindset saying, what is this range? What can I live with? What is our risk appetite matters in that, in that type of an environment? And as you look at those and how do I prevent certain situations that could occur from having the type of impact we won't live with, can't live with, and knowing those two. So that whole look at it as a distribution mm -hmm. as opposed to a point. You know, the shape of the curve versus an expected value right in the middle or at a certain peak. Craig, those are some very valuable insights. And thank you so much for 
providing us with your insightful opinion. I hope the CTM file audience would have gained a lot out of this conversation. I know I have, and I'd like to thank them as well as you for joining us on this edition of Open Treasury. Please subscribe and look in the show notes for the article links. Thank you. This podcast is provided for information purposes only and statements made by CTM file or guests on this podcast are not intended as legal, business or consulting advice. For more information visit ctmfile.com.